It's actually the field that's creating matter. So change the field and you change matter. This is the great secret that everyone knows except us in the West. Uh, almost any other culture that we go to from uh, uh, the monasteries in Egypt and, uh, and Tibet and India and Bolivia and Peru, the indigenous traditions, little villages in the Andes Mountains, they all know that there is this experience that we can have inside of our bodies that affects our world in some way and our science simply uh, has not allowed for that historically. And what we begin to understand is that this is the place where science got it wrong. There are two places, two assumptions that science has made, modern science, uh, and they're, they're coming full circle and correcting that now, but the first one is that the space that we believe is empty is not really so empty. It's, it's full of a, of a living essence, of a living material that we're only beginning to understand, number one. And number two, the fact, and it is a fact now, that we may have experiences inside of our bodies that influence the world beyond our bodies through the conduit of what's in this space. There is something that we can do in our lives that influence not only the, the physical body, uh, ours and, and those of other people around us, but, but literally influence the physical reality of our world. And that changes everything. It changes everything that we in the West believe about ourselves. We all are having experiences every day whether we are consciously aware of it or not, those experiences are physically affecting our bodies and our world. It is now a scientific fact that the, the space between things is anything but empty. It is full of a, a living, pulsating essence that is so new, scientists have yet to agree on a single term. Some are calling it a quantum hologram, very technical sounding name. Um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the former Apollo astronaut, I've had the honor of sharing a stage with him a number of times. He calls it nature's mind. Stephen Hawking calls it the mind of God. Others simply call it the field. 1944, the father of quantum physics, Max Planck, identified the existence of this field, and he called it the matrix. He said, underlying everything that we see, our bodies included, everything we see in the world around us and our bodies, he said, there is the existence of, of what must be a conscious and intelligent mind. This is his language in 1944. He said that this mind is the matrix of all matter, and it's from his work that the movie series uh, began and, and uh, many of the ideas that we have today. There's only two components, according to the research, that shows how to change the field. Here's an example. They did an experiment where they took a, people, a group of people that were great uh, healers. And um, they took these vials of DNA and set them out in front of these people. And they said, now listen, this is a mindful function. With all of your intention, we want you to see this DNA wind or unwind in your mind. Just keep seeing it wind or unwind, wind or unwind. So they did it over and over again, over and over again. They checked the DNA. Guess what happened? Nothing. Intention did nothing to change the DNA. So then they said, okay, open your heart, create an elevated emotion and just feel gratitude and radiate that feeling of care and love into the field and let's see if that changes the DNA. They elevate their emotional state, they do it for a period of time, they check the DNA, guess what happens? Nothing. But when they say to the people, we, what, what I want you to do is see the DNA unwind intention one frequency, the electrical charge in the quantum field, and feel the emotions you would feel as if it already unwound, elevated emotion, magnetic field in the, in the quantum, over 20% of the DNA unwound at a remote location. So thought being the electrical charge in the quantum field, feelings being the magnetic charge, how you think and how you feel broadcasts a field. So now, not just any type of field is gonna do that, it's gotta be coherent. So we practice creating brain coherence. We actually measure it. We practice creating heart coherence. Why? Because once energy moves right up in here and you can change resentment or frustration or impatience to joy, to freedom, to gratitude, and we're measuring to see if you're doing it. So now when the heart starts regulating, it starts beating like a drum and it starts to produce a measurable magnetic field. It's up to three meters wide. Now, that energy is a frequency, and that frequency can carry information, and that information is your thought, is your intent. In other words, the elevated emotional gratitude can carry the thought of your health. The emotion of suffering cannot carry the thought of your health. You can think positively all you want, and if you're feeling miserable, your mind and body are in opposition. 
these two coherent signatures together. The thought sending the signal out, the feeling drawing the event back. But the more coherent, the more organized the signal, the more connection you have to the field. So, so coherence is a synchronization. So what we know is this, is that we have the opportunity to influence that field in ways now that we're only beginning to understand. It's done through the human heart. It's not a thinking process. Thoughts are important. The ancients made a distinction between thoughts and feelings and emotions. And it's the feelings that are, are centered in our heart, what are called coherent, heart-based emotions. We know that when we feel a feeling of love, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, we change the self-esteem. Uh, that there is an effect from that, that it changes the electrical and the magnetic fields in our heart and that those fields literally change the stuff that our world is made of uh, around our bodies. Our hearts are the strongest magnetic field in, in our bodies and our, our hearts are the strongest electrical field in our bodies, much more so than the brain. While the brain does create those kinds of fields, the heart is many times stronger. And what the science now is showing is that when you can change the field, that the atom is in, you change the atom. And we're made of those atoms. So when we have feelings in our hearts, we're changing the field uh, that connects the stuff everything is made of, and we literally are altering our physical reality in ways that sound miraculous uh, in Western science. But again, this is the great secret everyone knows except us, because Western science has only arrived at this understanding. You go to these ancient and indigenous traditions and cultures, it's where they begin. They begin with the understanding, sure, everything's connected, and sure, we're part of it. And then they take us one step further, and they say, here, I'll show you. I'll show you how to create the, the effects in your body so that you, can, that you can heal your body, and you can heal the bodies of others. You can change your self-esteem, and your body will mirror that change. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long, slow, drawn-out process. It can happen uh, very, very quickly. It can happen in a matter of minutes. When people are under the gun of the fight or flight nervous system, they're living by the hormones of stress, the arousal of those chemicals drives the brain into a faster brain frequency called high beta brain waves. In high beta, the arousal, you're in survival. What you're trying to do now is control and predict everything in your life. And so you start thinking about your boss, your coworker, your boyfriend, you start thinking about groceries, you start thinking about where you have to go, all the things you have to do, your finances. And every one of those things elements, people, places, has a neurological network in your brain. So as you shift your attention very quickly, you're activating those circuits, and like a lightning storm in the clouds, your brain starts firing very incoherently. And when your brain's incoherent, you're incoherent. So now, what sinks in the brain, links in the brain. And when, when that starts to happen, when they start getting more organized, think about coherence like a group of people clapping in an audience, say there's a thousand people and you say normal coherence for an average human being would be every fifth person in the audience clapping at the same time. Super coherence, what we're measuring, imagine a hundred billion neurons synchronized. A thousand people all clapping at the same time, not only is it creating more order, and all of a sudden you start getting more energy in the brain, more synchronization, and all the areas that were no longer in balance start to come together. And the side effect of that is now the person starts feeling more whole. They acknowledge what is and invite a new possibility rather than having a charge on, on what is there and feeling that somehow we have to manipulate uh, or change, hammer the physical reality into submission. What they're doing is acknowledging that, that moment, that example, and they're changing it on the, the level of what we would call the quantum blueprint. They're feeling the feeling as if another possibility has, has occurred, and in doing so, allowing that possibility to replace the one that exists without judging the one that exists. So I use the word energy centers because if you say chakras, some people will have the wrong understanding of them. These different energy centers of the body are centers of information. They have their own frequency, they have their own energy, they have their own little individual brains, they have their own hormones, their own chemicals. So those different circuit boards are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. Now, stress creates imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is switched on for one reason, emergency for preservation. So then you are mobilizing enormous energy to preserve the body, and it should be a short-term thing. The other nervous system, the parasympathetic, is for growth and repair, right? 
So some people spend the majority of their time living in that high frequency of, of, of stress. Um, so then teaching people then how to make a move from that sympathetic system into the parasympathetic system means they have to practice on a daily basis certain fundamental principles. When you're in stress, when you're in survival, you narrow your focus on a cause. That's called a, what's called a convergent focus. And when the autonomic nervous system moves out of balance, the brain moves out of balance, right? We narrow our focus on the cause, and it causes each one of these different energy centers to move into incoherence as well. And those little, little individual brains start moving into incoherence and send an incoherent message to the cells and tissues and organs. Hormones then become down-regulated and the body starts moving out of balance. So when we bless the energy centers or we pro reprogram these energy centers, two things has to happen. They have to be able to slow their brain waves down. They have to get out of that high beta state. And the way we do it is to go from a narrow focus to a broad focus. When you open your focus, when you open your awareness, that's what creates coherence, going against that habit of putting your attention on matter. So there's a convergent focus, which is focusing on matter, and then there's a divergent focus, which is focusing on energy. Well, reality is both particle and wave. So if a person can slow their brain waves down from beta brain waves to alpha brain waves, now they're starting to fall out of their thinking right into the home of the autonomic nervous system. The second thing that has to happen is that they have to practice both a convergent focus and a divergent focus. First you focus on that energy center, that's particle, and then you focus on the space around it, that's okay. wave. And so when you open your awareness and you're able to do that and you're in your autonomic nervous system, you can put an intention there. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. Send the coherent message to the cells and tissues. So now that energy is gonna cause the person to have a different consciousness, a different thought pattern. Now they're gonna be thinking possibility, because in survival, the first three ones are all about survival. Uh -huh. It's really not a creative process of creating from mind. It's more about a more primitive, humanistic part of us, you know, animal part of us. So then there's the thyroid plexus, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. So we've seen when people create coherence in each one of these energy centers and they do it properly, they know how to change their brain waves. They get into the operating system. They can master convergent and divergent focus. They're no longer living just this way. They've practiced opening their awareness and focus on energy, becoming conscious of it. And as these brains become more coherent and they start producing different signals to hormones and chemicals and into different glands in the body, that's what's being upregulated to make different, different expressions. So you, you can't control that with your conscious mind. You gotta get beyond your conscious mind and stay conscious in your subconscious mind. And the thought is important. The ancients are very clear about this in the Sanskrit text. They, they tell us that the thought is the image of the quantum possibility. So in other words, in, in the realm of all possibilities, everything already exists. My friend's perfect relationship and the worst one he'll ever have. Uh, the lightest of the light, the darkest of the dark, our, our greatest healing and our greatest suffering, they're already there. And what they invite us to do in these ancient traditions is to reach into those possibilities with our mind. This is the power of the mind. And isolate, we lock in one of those possibilities. So now we have taken it and identified it. However, to bring it into this world, to breathe life into that possibility is the power of human emotion. Our love for that possibility or our fear of that possibility, either one will work. To bring that quantum possibility into the particle reality of our everyday lives. We don't have to know that. It sounds very technical. We just have a feeling. But this is the science of, uh, appears to be the science of, of how these things are working. It's not something you sit down and do for a minute and then you get up and walk away. Rather, it's something that we become. We live our lives as if these experiences have already happened. And in that way, we invite them into our lives and they happen frighteningly quickly for some people. And that's how quickly reality can change.